everyone and uh, a warm welcome uh, to welcome you all for today's Institute lecture. Uh, the speaker of the day is uh, Dr. Praveen Bhagat and uh, Dr. Praveen is an entrepreneur and a wireless security researcher. He was uh, co-founder and CTO of Mojo Networks, a product venture which started in the year 2003 from Pune and grew to become one of the leading providers of cloud management uh, secure Wi-Fi uh, for the global market. Praveen started his research career at the IBM Thomas J. Watson Research Center and the at and Labs, where he was a lead member of mobile uh, uh, now Wi-Fi and Bluetooth research teams. He has numerous research publications and more than 25 patents to his credit. Prior to starting his entrepreneurial journey, uh, Dr. Praveen served as a visiting faculty at the Computer Science Department at IIT Kanpur. And in 2005, Praveen was awarded the MIT's Global Indus uh, Technovator Award. And he has also been the recipient of the IIT Kanpur Distinguished Alumnus Award in the year 2019. Without further ado, I now request Dr. Praveen to deliver his talk on Ideas to Ventures, Three Short Stories. So thank you. I think it's always my great pleasure to be uh, among the students of IIT Kanpur and faculty members. And I have distinct memories of attending many lectures in this very room. And uh, in fact, uh, we had a very uh, memorable incident. Uh, uh, I think maybe Manoj, Manoj will recall, he was my batchmate that uh, in one of the chemistry uh, class, uh, Professor P.K. Ghosh had a PhD student who one day walked into the classroom wearing all Bhagwa clothes and shouting that, you know, everything that you are uh, doing is all mithya and the only thing real is uh, Shiv. And he drew a sign of Sai, the Shiv's Trishul on the board and left and people were like shocked, what is going on? <laughs> and then Professor P.K. Ghosh came in and said, you know, now that he has given us the guidance, we are going to start the Schrodinger equation. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that very incident, if I recall, happened in this very room uh, when we were going through our second year of undergrad. So very, very uh, rich memories of uh, spending time at IITK campus. And I think one of the uh, key lessons that at least I took away, uh, when I came in uh, into IIT Kanpur, you know, you are like a school kid coming out of school, but the campus really, the interactions with all your friends and the discussions you have in the mess and the chai, uh, it sort of opens up your mind to kind of newer possibilities. And you kind of start imagining bigger world, and uh, you thought that transformation tag takes place during the you know, four years you are here. So I'll actually tell you sort of my personal experience of walking through this path. And rather than keeping a talk very technical at you know, 6.30 PM at night, I'll try to keep it much sort of light humored. So if I had to sort of distill down what are some interesting, memorable things I've done in the last few years since I graduated, I've boiled it down to like three small short stories and to put these uh, stories in sort of a context i remember once i was giving a talk and one person in the audience asked me a question that you know what are the things that you have done that have really given you a sense of joy in your life and i was kind of put on the spot and i was kind of struggling for a good example and then i recall that when i was a kid probably you know in the four year old and the very first time I rode the bicycle, it was such an aha moment that, you know, you are balancing the whole thing on two wheels and uh, it was uh, like a joy of life that I think, I don't think I have experienced ever since that incident happened. And I think there are a few more things down the life which have happened, which have come close to that joy. And those three key moments is what I have tried to summarize in, in, in the talk today. Uh, and, and the, the one interesting kind of a lesson from this bicycle ride, if you look at the kid who ride, rides the bicycle, 
it doesn't understand the laws of physics at all. In fact, the physics of bicycle is so complicated that I challenge that even after doing your basic physics course, you can't put it down on a piece of paper. It's very, very complicated. But still, the kid is able to ride the bicycle and you know derive joy out of it. So why does it happen? Because there is a strong sense of desire that you know I want to ride the bicycle. And you kind of fall down, you get up again, you try it again, you get bruised, but you don't give up and you keep trying and there's an immense amount of joy you derive out of that whole experience and journey of learning a bicycle, right? So three stories. Uh, the one is, you know, the whole experience of building a venture completely ground up. Um, uh, I, was in, I was the founder of a company name, which was originally called Airtight Networks, became Mojo Networks. It got acquired by Arista just about three years ago. And <coughs> started with Yahoo for a brief period. Um, it was an immensely, uh, immensely in, in, enjoyable ride. And the story of this whole venture, I gave it as a talk when I visited IIT Kanpur last time. So I'm not going to repeat that talk. So the, the first story has already been told once. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is a completely different thing that I've done uh, uh, after you know, doing a tech venture. And that is a project named 14 Trees, which is going to be the focus of today's talk. And more apt topic since the talk is hosted by a Center of Sustainability and, and a Renewable Energy Center at IIT Kanpur. So it relates to the uh, topics which are very close to what the center is trying to do. And if there is time left uh, towards the end, and that depends on how much amount of Q&A we have, if there is about five, seven, eight minutes of time left at the end, then I will tell you a little bit about the third story, which is a movie that I was involved in making. Uh, so three completely different things that I've sort of done over the last, uh, I would say, how many? Uh, 30 years since we graduated. Uh, and, uh, all, and I think these three uh, experiences have come close to the joy of riding the first bicycle. So I'm here today to share my kind of a second uh, story. So what is 14 trees? So it's a experiment to figure out how completely barren land uh, can be transformed into a jungle. And this is actually a Google map uh, image of the area where we are working. And you can see the large tracts which are completely deforested now. Once upon a time, this used to be a completely lush green uh, jungle. But today, it's a completely ecologically devastated uh, area. And uh, we are trying to kind of rejuvenate the whole uh, area. Now, how did the story begin? So I'll kind of show you an interesting connection between the first story of building a tech startup and completely transferring uh, gears into planting trees. So this actually is a picture from year 2005 when we had organized a company off-site meeting in Lonavla. So I was driving from Pune to Lonavla Along the road, these are the pictures that I took along the highway, Bombay-Pune highway. So there are large tracts of land just being burnt. So it kind of, you know, since I'm a big nature lover, I like to do hiking, trekking. I want to see nature preserved. And then you are going for this company off-site meeting where, you know, 10 folks are flying from US. We are going to be in Lonavla for three days to do company strategy meeting. And this is the backdrop against which you are going for the company offsite, it kind of puts you into a different mood. So that was kind of a moment where I realized that, you know, while I am doing this tech startup, uh, and we are building our business and selling globally and all that, but there is very little influence or value we are able to add in our own surroundings where we are living. So this whole problem of people, you know, burning large tracts of land, destroying all the jungles, I mean, you know, we got to do something about it. So this was a backdrop, a thought which was always there in my mind. And that thinking actually eventually evolved into shaping of this project, 14 Trees, which I'm going to talk to you about today. So the way the story goes that this piece of land near Pune, it used to look like this about 50 years ago. But today, if you look at the Google map of the same area, it looks like somebody has done a pure crew cut shave of the head. 
all the trees are gone and things get worse in the month of march april thousands of hectares are just burnt so essentially what has happened villages have cut the trees and have converted that land into grassland so you essentially let the cattle loose for grazing and after the grazing season is over the tradition is to burn the whole land and by burning the belief is that all the biomass converts into fertilizer and it promotes the growth of grass next year during after monsoon so your surface area for grass increases and you get more fodder for the cattle and every year you keep expanding the area that you are essentially using this way so while immediate benefits are derived no question but on a long term basis the land becomes completely dead all the nutrients start leaching out top soil starts uh, uh, sort of getting uh, it becomes loose it flows with the rain water uh, the top soil is gone the trees cannot grow and essentially a green patch of land becomes a complete uh, ecological disaster so i sort of thought you know there has to be a better way than how we are using the land in in this form so in year 2013 i actually acquired a piece of land uh, in in pune and the picture that you see on the bottom left is exactly how the land looked and picture in the rest of the frame is how the same land looks now so this these these two pictures are taken exactly from the same spot with the same angle and you can see the before and after and this transformation uh, it took about 8 years to uh, unfold so it was like a small lab experiment i was doing near pune while in the foreground the mojo networks uh, drama was unfolding but this was my weekend kind of a decompression project and when this thing kind of uh, clicked it looked like you know it it looks promising it can be done and then like any you know uh, venture idea we think how do we scale so the idea evolved into how do we scale this to a larger level because taking a small piece of land and putting all your energy and resources into it is doable but how do you scale it to a bigger level so fortinity is an attempt to search for a replicable model for doing it at a bigger and bigger bigger scale so it's an ongoing project by no means uh it is done but uh, it's a journey that we are currently working through and i'm i'm glad that some of the faculty members sitting in this room uh, had a chance to visit it recently just about uh, two months ago maybe just a month ago and uh, that this stuff is and i think one uh, important point i will show you this in this talk every picture i will show you is real there is no stock photography no downloaded pictures from google uh, image library everything is real so uh, so that's sort of how the switch from a complete tech to a totally non tech kind of a thought thought began and uh, so obviously how do we uh, go about restoring the land you plant trees you uh, allow them to naturally grow and today actually tree plantation is a fad i mean everybody is planting trees and posting pictures on facebook and feeling good about it so i often get asked you know so you are also planting trees so what's the big deal what's the difference so i'll explain you you know in what ways what we're trying to do is is different what is the thought behind it and so on so if we dissect the problem of rejuvenating ecology you need a piece of land that you are going to rejuvenate you need to bring water from somewhere because without water nothing happens you need to choose what kind of species you want to bring on that land and you have to protect it for some time before it becomes self sufficient right so these are the four basic fundamental things you have to do and you can compare any plantation project along these four axes to analyze what choices they are making along this right so as far as our choice of land is concerned we are deliberately choosing that piece of land which was once upon a time jungle but has been destroyed by human activity so it's ecologically devastated piece of land if land is already fertile it already has water all the facilities so often time i get offers after seeing our work that you know why don't you come to our area we have you know nice soil we have great water everything is there so i said then why do you need us if you have soil if you have water just go and do it yourself 
So we are working only on that piece of land which is God forsaken land. People believe nothing can be done. It's barren. It uh, has no life left. There's no water. So, so we deliberately go and choose uh, that that piece of land for rejuvenation. Now, the biggest challenge in such a piece of land is where are you going to bring water from? Because if the water was available, the land would already be in use. Somebody would be uh, cultivating it and so on, right? So, so by definition, there is no water there. And by me, by I mean no water meaning no easy access to piped water. If you drill, there is no groundwater. So the only source of water is actually rainwater. So we are deliberately selected a piece of land where we have only choice to tap rainwater and nothing else. And the way we go about doing it is that we strategically identify spots where we can do rainwater harvesting, collect some water and store it year round so that we can provide some little bit of water to the tree throughout the year. Now how do we do it? I will show you some pictures. So we have dug around 64 ponds in the area where we are working. And out of these 64 ponds, about 42 are able to hold water. And, and the remaining 22 are just percolation ponds, meaning they collect water and the water seeps uh, underground. So you basically have both. Ponds which hold water, ponds which don't hold water. And yet both are very useful because the ponds which don't hold water allow that water to be seeped under, underground and that's what allows the groundwater recharging to happen. So we have a combination of both. <laughs> but the key is that we are not trying to bring in any piped water at all. We are not trying to do borewell at all, just drain water storage. Hmm. So that takes care of how we bring our water. Now third key issue is what kind of species you plant. Now typically when we think of plantation, our immediate thought is, you know, let's plant something we shall generate fruits, some yield in two years, three years, we can generate returns, make some money, pay for the cost. But the problem is that's a very human centric view of looking at the nature. Hmm. So what we have done is we have been lucky that we have gotten a lot of guidance from ecologists and botany expert who have studied flora and fauna of Sahyadri mountain region over the last 25 years. So they shared with me a list of 220 species of plants, trees, herbs, which are endemic to that region. So we have brought seeds of those varieties grown into saplings and planted only those uh, varieties in the project side. Now these trees do not have commercial value. Many of them don't have commercial value, some do. And then people say, why are you planting them? Well, there is a whole ecosystem which depends on them. There are insects, there are butterflies, there are birds, there are animals. It's a food for them. And the problem today is that all such trees, herbs are disappearing because humans don't find any value in them. So you are chopping them off and replacing them by only yield centric varieties. And the problem with that, it, it, ecosystem requires everything, all kinds of uh, uh, combinations of things and so we are trying to essentially recreate that original jungle variety that used to exist before human intervention started. And interestingly, a lot of these trees actually have medicinal value or some very uh, yet to be discovered functions. So it's important to protect those species otherwise you know a few years down the road we may not even find them. So essentially idea is to bring back the original glory of the jungle whatever was there. Now here when we are doing planting, as I mentioned, the, uh, the objective is not to generate returns on investment, that the capital that is going in, but instead create a sustainable uh, ecosystem. So again, once we have done that, we are observing that the insects are coming back, butterflies are coming back, lizards are coming back and the big, biggest, the best proof of the experiment succeeding is that last year, February onwards, a leopard has started coming to the area because now there is water, there is food available and an apex predator showing up is a sign of sort of the A plus grade that you can expect for any, any, any piece of work that you are doing because you can't <coughs> bring, bring them in through any other means. So that process uh, has already started. Now it is easy to plant but ensuring that that sapling survives is, is the most difficult part. And I think uh, 
so there's a difference between a kid being born and kid being raised there's a huge difference between the two events exactly sap planting a sapling and making sure the sapling survives is exactly the same uh, level of difficulty and here what we are doing is there's a too much of pressure from grazing uh, the people who graze grass and they are not going to disappear even if you put fences they will cut the fences and come in so what we have done is every sapling we protect using a tree guard which is made by the local tribals so every sapling is protected so the grazing can continue and that sapling also grows and after 3 years the tree becomes self sufficient that it can withstand uh, any any grazing activity in the area so for every sapling we ensure protection for 3 years and then uh, things sort of work uh, it sort of becomes an autopilot or self sustainable beyond that point so the four things that i mentioned you know identify the most difficult land uh, arrange water through rain water uh, rain water harvesting choose right saplings and then finally ensure protection now these four are the technical four pillars that you have to take care of and to tell you honestly there is really no rocket science here at all we all understand exactly what is involved in doing it so absolutely no you know new innovation or new idea here at all the only thing is we are doing it very systematically because we come from an it background so every tree is tagged we know exactly when the water was given who did it we are keeping all the database and information about that the more difficult uh, aspect of this project which i learned uh, while executing this that this while it may seem difficult this is the easy part the more difficult part actually is doing it in presence of humans because humans are the ones who have destroyed the nature and humans are the ones which will not let you do this because there are so many variables i mean there is a local gram uh, sarpanch involved there is a local farmer involved there are some notorious elements who want to extract money out of you so i have had that in the last 8 years there have been two fir's that we have been through to continue to do our projects so many many trips to the police station to <laughs> sort out the matter so getting the humans to kind of agree to what you are doing i think is the most difficult part and what i learned is technology actually has a very important role to play in solving this problem and i'll give you some examples of it how how that actually going going to happen so so let me begin with kind of one example this is a picture of the attendance board at our project site so project is run completely by tribals so those who show up for work their pictures are put on the board so every day this picture changes so whoever comes the picture is there right and we take a picture of this board and store it in our database so what happened initially we were doing attendance by spreadsheets calling the names who is present who is absent and what happened was my daughter who is a design student at nid ahmedabad because of covid she was stuck at home so i used to take her to the site and she said you know what are you guys doing I mean, this, this is so boring the way you do it you need to add some jazz to this whole thing <laughs> so so she added some jazz that came up with the design of the board and this actually clicked that the workers started feeling good that you know there is a picture of them uh, on the site they started taking the picture sharing it in their whatsapp group believe it or not the whatsapp is now even widely used among among the tribal community and this picture became viral in the in the in the tribal community so few days later we saw 10 more guys came and said you know we also want our picture on the board <laughs> so i said well come on in let's start working and 15 days later 20 more people showed up so he said okay come on in so th that's how our recruitment started you know picking up momentum so now we have about 105 people who are working on this project and in fact we have a negative attrition problem <laughs> nobody leaves we have more people ready to work because they are deriving a sense of kind of a joy and uh, purpose and there is an emotional connect between them and and the project so what we figured out to actually solve the human uh, angle getting human aligned that emotional connect is a very very important thing so this actually solved our all workforce labor union problems because now everybody feels 
this is part of the big project that they are part of and they are enjoying the journey. So that took care of our kind of workforce motivation and all these uh, issues, right? The next example I show you, though, the trees that we planted along the road. I took the name of all the villagers from the Sarpanch and put a name plate of every villager on the road. So now there is a tree in the name of every local villager. So when people saw their own name attached to the tree, they were like kind of amused. So not that they will start uh, watering the tree themselves, but at least now they become vigilant. The person who is responsible for planting, watering that, uske piche log lagte hain ki bas tum kal dikhai nahi diye kahan gaye the so that local pressure on the performer is already built up it becomes a topic of the town and the guy disappears and contrast it with the government did a 33 crore tree plantation drive 2 years ago theek hai but those trees are hard to find because nobody cares but here what has happened, that emotional connect between the tree and the people has happened and automatically our survival rate has shot up to close to 100%. Our trees don't die because people, it becomes their prestige issue to make sure their tree stays alive. So very kind of a non techy answers to solving some real life problems. So now what we did, we extended this idea to the visitors. So when visitors come to our site, our every tree has an ID, just like you have a MAC address for every Ethernet port, we have a MAC address for every tree. And when people plant, we associate their name with that address and we take their pictures and then people naturally ask after four or five months, what is So we say, we'll send you an update. So people become sort of connected, connected to that. So at that point, once the emotional connect is formed, we don't talk about statistics, you know, our survival rate is 60% or 70% because you never say, if somebody asks you what is survival rate of your family member, you don't say it's 80%. I mean, every family member is important and you fight as much as hard to make sure everybody gets good care. So that, that sentiment, we are trying to bring it into this plantation scheme through this simple idea of connecting names, names with trees. So once this basic idea clicked, now, very interesting thing happened. Uh, 2020, uh, I identified that there was a large tract of land available there. And you're thinking, you know, how do we go about sort of scaling up this project? And IIT Kanpur was celebrating his Diamond Jubilee exactly the same year. And because of COVID, all the celebrations worldwide were cancelled. So I called up Professor Karandikar that, you know, we have to celebrate our Diamond Jubilee and we can't step out of our home, so what do we do? I said, I have a lot of land. I can plant tree in the name of every graduate of IIT Kanpur. There are 40,000 of them who have graduated from this institute since 1965 when the institute was formed. And he said, it's a great idea, let's do it. So I've started a campaign where the idea is there will be a tree in the name of everyone including all of you who are sitting in this class. And someday I hope some of you will come and plant it by your own hand. But the project is moving at full speed. We are planting trees and mapping them to, so there is now batch wise grove. Batch of 1990, batch of 1991, 2005. And the interesting thing is that if each graduate were to plant one tree, 150 acres of forest or barren land will get transformed into a jungle. Such a simple thing. And interestingly, this idea is now spreading. So suddenly I was contacted by IIT Bombay. They heard, you know, some IITK guys are doing something interesting. So I said, well, you guys can also <laughs> join. And I said, you know, we are planting 40,000 trees. You think you are number one? Well, beat this number. <laughs> so we'll see whether they can execute something like this. So we are getting this, you know, healthy competition kind of, uh, so suddenly COEP Pune, PICT Pune, IIT Delhi, all kind of now waking up. And I think that's the uh, sort of emotional energy is what you want to unleash, to channel it sort of in, in this direction. So once you got this basic construct, there are kind of interesting variations of this you can try. So we have one plot, which is we call as the IIT Kanpur Faculty Grove. 
all the faculty members who have retired, there's a tree in their name. And I think some of you have seen this. Uh, year 2020 February is when my younger daughter graduated from a school and they invited me as a speaker at the farewell. So I since only think about trees, I took 60 saplings in my car. And he said, what have you brought? I said, no, that's a plan. So at the end of the talk, I said, everybody is going to hold a sapling in the hand and we'll create a memorial grove. So the Gurukul school's graduation grove is created at a project site. And now those 60 kids uh, can have their 10-year celebration by coming to that spot and enjoying a memorial which stands to memorialize their graduation from the school. So this idea again going viral. Now every school is saying, you know, we should be doing a grove like this to celebrate our graduation. Now, an alumni from 1987 batch, uh, he contacted me once. His mother actually died during COVID time. So he said, can I come and plant a memorial tree in, in memory of my mother? I said, come and do it. So he actually came at the peak of summer. As you can, this picture was taken when there were like 40 degree heat and he came and he planted trees. And we then decided, you know, why don't we call this plot a Smriti one? So it becomes, so that plot has since been uh, attracting more people to come and plant kind of memorial trees. Then they said, why only plant trees in the name of dead people? You know, there are people alive. <laughs> so one of my friends said, you know, I'll plant trees in my name of entire Biradri, the mother's side and the father's side. So uh, um, Rohit Toshniwal, he's a 1999 grad from IIT Kanpur. And uh, he's taken a tract of land and he's planting trees for his entire Biradri. <clears throat> so, and then some people said, you know, there's a marriage anniversary coming, so let's create a grove to celebrate our 25 years of marriage. Then uh, again, so wherever I go, so I was invited to give a talk at ComSnet's conference. And at the end of the talk, they give you this plaque, wooden thing, which frankly becomes a liability. You don't know, you, can't, you, can't, you don't want to throw it away because <coughs> somebody has given you with a lot of respect. But what do you do with it? It occupies space and, you know, so I said, instead of giving this, why don't you just, you know, give trees? So they actually thought about it and have decided that now onward they will only give trees instead of giving these, these, these um, mementos. So the word spread from CompSnets into IEEE community and then to ACM community. So ACM is the Association of Computer Scientists, IEEE is the Association of Electrical Engineers. And both of them have now decided that they will now onward give trees instead of giving these mementos. So I think the best validation of an idea is that as some of the urban crowd has started getting excited, more recently, the villagers have started coming to the project site. You know, they also want to sort of join. So these are sort of random pictures of local villagers who have come. And now we have a process. Everybody who walks in, we write their name, we take their pictures. So more than I think about 2,000 odd villagers have come and Start. And this has all has happened without any persuasion or any marketing, advertisement. this is organically kind of, kind of growing. So now, in a nutshell, what is happening is more than 200 acres of barren land is currently um, under transformation. And as I said, out of 64, 42 water bodies are being created in areas in land where literally there was nothing. So in fact, this picture will give you a feel for how we create water bodies. Is exactly at the same spot. People thought, you know, the water body cannot come here. But this is a this is a hole dug in a rock, and basalt is impermeable, so it holds water through the year. And just to give you the animation again, it is exactly the same spot. And people early thought that water bodies cannot come here. But we have such 42 bodies littered throughout the throughout the project area. We have done a lot of roadside plantations, and this is something which catches attention as people drive through and uh, so more and more villagers are now getting excited, you know, we should be doing this kind of plantation in their area also. So about 22 villages nearby have come and forward and joined, joined this movement. So demand actually naturally is uh, organically kind of building up. So the project which started from four acres has now spread to um, more than 350 acres of uh, land, 
uh, more than 52 kilometers of roadside, 22 villages, and again, absolutely no uh, outbound uh, marketing at all. Hmm. There's a list of villages which are now joining, and in process, we have created 100 plus uh, green jobs. So these are the people who are daily wage workers and now becoming uh, members of the 14 trees worker worker family. So question is, you know, where do we go from here? <clears throat> So I subscribe to this uh, basic uh, philosophy that any large scale management problem you can split it into, you know, first you learn how to crawl and then you learn how to walk and then you decide how to run. You should not go from crawl to run directly because now we are getting a lot of offers. Uh, government is getting interested that, you know, let us scale up this experiment big time throughout Maharashtra, do pan India. To me, that seems like, a, you know, trying to jump into the run lane from crawl because to scale to that level, you need to have basic processes, systems uh, built up. Otherwise, you will fall flat. You will not be able to cope up with that kind of a speed and demand. So, what you want to do now is having come this far, our next step is walk. And I'll share this is a kind of again a very crazy idea. The area that I'm showing you here is about 10 square mile size. It's completely barren mountain. Hmm. And obviously we don't own it. It's the ownership is spread among private farmers, uh, Gram Panchayat, Forest Department. And the idea is whatever we have done, can it be done over this scale? And it is it's an experiment which requires alignment of all of these various stakeholders, departments. And again, the human alignment, I think, is a, a, the most difficult part. Technically, we have shown how to do it, but still uh, getting all stakeholders aligned is not easy, especially anything to do with land. There's too much money involved and too many vested interests involved. So it's very difficult to earn that trust that you are doing it just out of desire to restore nature. You have no commercial uh, motive behind it. Very hard to convince, very hard to convince people. The only way to see is to come outside and see it. So what you want to do is to kind of expand the project to this scale. And that's where the collaboration with IIT Kanpur and the mission that, you know, the sustainability center has set forward is so exciting. Because we are doing a complete, we are trying to make IIT Kanpur a net zero carbon emission campus. Whatever lessons we learned from this, if we can then apply those into a real life setting. See, here it is easier because the entire campus is under a single administrative control. But executing the same ideas, see, here people find difficulty that you know, some, this department is not aligning, that person is not aligning. That problem is here also. But imagine multiplying the problem hundredfold when you go into a public place like this. But it's an exciting, interesting exercise and lot of uh, learning yet to, yet to be done to execute a project of this scale. Um, so we are kind of setting out on a journey to see if in the next few years, see if we can transform that entire land into green. Hmm. Now whether or not it's going to be possible, whether it will remain a utopian dream, I don't know. But <clears throat> In the context of this decade, where worldwide there is awareness or desire to promote ecology restoration projects throughout the world, the timing of this idea is very, very uh, apt. That there is a global awareness, people want this thing to happen, we are conducting a large scale experiment. So if we can pull it off, uh, it can really be a good example, not only for India, but globally, because such an experiment. Uh, at least I am not aware of uh, something of this size and scale is, is being tried elsewhere. So, uh, and, and the interesting thing is that to pull something off, it requires expertise from such a diverse set of areas. You, you need uh, expertise in ecology, economics, social sciences, and also technology. And I will actually show you a couple of examples of where technology uh, is, is playing an important role. Maybe I will take that. Uh, detour right now to tell you an interesting technology uh, problem here. So, remember the attendance board uh, 
idea I told, told you about. If we have to scale this idea to, to say 1000 sites, currently the way we do the attendance, these pictures are put up and some person then looks at the pictures and writes down the names, who has come in, who has not come in. But then, you know, as a computer scientist, you look at the problem. If I take a picture of this board and if I train an ML engine to recognize these faces, then I can automatically extract who is there and fill up that spreadsheet of attendance, right? I don't need to manually fill it up. And if I scale this project to 10,000 sites, all I need is a picture coming from each site to the cloud and I'll automatically track who's coming to work and who's not coming to work. So that's where a very cool application of ML engine can be applied. And interestingly, there's a company named crowdcrafts.com. They are doing a lot of ML work, uh, sort of cloud-based ML uh, apps they are building. And the founder happens to be my batchmate. So he once came to the site and he said, look, I love it. So he is using this problem to train the new recruits to go through this problem and solve it and that becomes a training program for the company. And he has already built an engine which is about 92% accurate. And I have given a challenge, 92% accurate is not good enough because I want 100%. We are using this attendance, so we are paying money. We can't afford any misses. So they are now working on how to get 100% accuracy on this ML engine. So just an example of a very low tech setting but an extremely high tech application to scale up. So I think whenever you talk about scale up, another interesting problem I'll tell you, uh, 87 batch graduate is a person named Ramana Atre. Uh, he uh, is a guy who is an astronomer and he also teaches computational biology at ISR Pune. So he has developed a technique where he uses moths as a way to measure the health of an ecosystem. So the way the idea works, you set up a screen at night which attracts and you throw light at the screen. So a lot of insects and moths come and they stick to the screen. And you take a picture of that screen and you count how many moths are there and how many types of moths are there. So the hypothesis is that if you have a very diverse set of moths and large number of them, it's an indication of a healthy ecosystem. If you do the experiment in a desert, you will not see any moths. But that process of counting and identifying is very laborious. It takes them a month to come up with the uh, how many moths and how many types are there. And that problem is perfectly suited for an ML training. That you train an ML engine to recognize moths with all orientations and varieties. So just take one picture and you can essentially build a biodiversity detector. So that's another project we are going to be doing this summer. So again, a very low tech setting, but an extremely high tech idea is being applied to scale this thing up. So coming back to the point I was mentioning earlier. So in this decade, uh, there is an opportunity to think big uh, I do a larger scale experiment and that's where um, uh, it's turning out to be an exciting. So how, how do you scale up the model? So basically we are now learning that there are multiple stakeholders. Obviously you need government bodies to collaborate, 14 trees is enabler, uh, you also need corporate sponsors and then you need locals who need to be recognized into this experiment. So if you kind of somehow bring them all together, that's the beginning of uh, building up a scale. So most recently the word has gone out, the entire Pune district administration. So the person on the right is the divisional commissioner, the collector of Pune, the chief of uh, forest, the uh, Jilla Parishad CEO, everybody came and now pretty much everyone is warming to the idea, you know, let's do this experiment at a, at a bigger scale. And more recently, I don't know how many of you can recognize, uh, Mr. Ramadurai, he uh, was the CEO of TCS uh, until recently. Uh, he heard about the project and he drove all the way from Mumbai to see it in the middle of, so this picture was taken in the middle again, 38 degree heat at the top of the mountain and he came and he is now trying to mobilize the Tata group to, you know, take it seriously. So we'll see, hopefully some good things will come out of this. So I have, you know, done some bit of work in my early career in open source software, in open networking, where a bunch of people just came together, worked just for the joy of working on that idea. There was no commercial interest. So similar spirit, we want to evolve this into an open source environment project where you know everybody, anybody who's got a great idea, interest, just come on over, 
do your thing, it sort of evolves into a platform. And we are beginning to sign up partners. And I'm very, very happy that we are building a sort of very deep relationship with IIT Kanpur uh, Sustainability Center. And in the process, we are going to expand uh, this group to, to doing more things. So often sort of people come and ask me, you know, why, why kind of, where does the name 14 tree comes from? And there's actually an uh, interesting story behind it that when my daughter was in sixth grade, uh, she once came to me with some questions uh, around her biology textbook. And I read the chapter on photosynthesis. So it's interesting, you know, when you read a sixth grade book, after 30 years of uh, professional life, you discover some new insights. And I had my like another aha moment when I read that sixth grade book and read that equation of photosynthesis. And the aha moment was that it had never occurred to me. I mean, you know, you see so much of uh, what do you call it? the Hindi word is prakriti around you. So much of creation, trees and everything. It had never occurred to me that actually all of that is nothing but water and carbon dioxide molecules combined. That's it. Land, soil has very little role to play. The, the big banyan tree that you see standing, you think it is coming out of the ground. The ground has very little role to play. Less than half a percent of the weight is actually from the ground. 99.5 percent of that weight is nothing but water and carbon dioxide molecules. So when that realization, I mean, I had read that equation in sixth grade myself, but it, I never had that aha moment. But at the age of 48, I think when I read it, it was like, wow. And then it sort of triggered a series of interesting questions. Because I've been traveling a lot. And you know, in the flight, you sometimes get quality time to read, reflect. I recall reading an article once, you know, it said global CO2 emissions are rising, they're like 20 point some billion tons being spewed out into the air every year. And I look at the number and say, so is this big? Is this small? I have no feel for it. 20 billion tons of CO2. I mean, relative to the earth, is this small, big? I don't know. And I'm a computer scientist and I'm having a tough time grasping that number. So I'm wondering how can people relate to it? But when I read that photosynthesis equation, it suddenly occurred to me that, you know, maybe there is a way to present these numbers in a form where people can relate to them. So I became curious that, you know, we are talking about CO2 emissions, that so much automobile emissions, so much emission from the airplane, so much emission from electricity generation. But we are also CO2 emitters. We are breathing in oxygen, breathing out CO2. So let's calculate how much CO2 we are breathing out. So I did those calculations. In a, in a one day, how much CO2 we breathe out? In one week, in one month, in one year, and over 100 years of lifespan. So the number that comes out, if you integrate over 100 years of lifespan, so basically the idea is if you plant 14 trees, that entire CO2 you breathe out will get absorbed. So now it be, makes sense that you know, my carbon footprint is equivalent to 14 trees. So at least the least I should do is plant 14 trees before I die. So everyone I meet, <laughs> I ask them, you know, what is your counter today? <laughs> you only got another 20, 30 years left. So you better finish your debt before that. And the interesting thing is, you know, 14 trees seems a doable number to everybody. It's not a big number. But if you think of it, if you go and try to find space where you're going to plant those 14 trees, you will not find it. So that's where this idea that, you know, there's so much of barren land sitting. There's so many millions of people without work and need to do so much of plantation. If you can connect them together, you can sort of enable. So that's essentially the utopian idea that grow this open source movement over the next 20, 25 years to where you encourage every human being on earth to plant 14 trees. So I'll stop at this point. So that is the short story number two. And if there is time, <clears throat> yeah. uh, I don't know what is the hard stop here. If there is time, I, I, I can spend a few minutes on the uh, third story. Hmm? So, or, or if people have any questions on this, we can first quickly finish Q&A and then go to the third story. Yes. So, uh, like, on the 
all the land, uh, you have to like uh, bought some land or uh, it is just uh, government land. Uh, no, no, so we started with buying some land because to start this chain reaction, you have to demonstrate the idea. So we demonstrated this idea uh, on uh, the land that we bought and now we are encouraging the private farmers, Gram Panchayat, Forest Department to make their land available, there we can do this plantation. So, uh, how they are uh, like benefiting from it? Like, uh, like, uh, because we are putting the capital for the entire uh, uh, tree plantation and, and the yield and of… how you are getting uh, capital for like for this much uh, land? Yes, yes. So, capital the way we are doing crowdsourcing. It is purely crowdsourced project. And the yield from the trees, the landowner will get. So, that model seems to be people liking it. Sir, yes. I am asking a question for the future perspective. Yes. So, uh, if you ever think like we got habitual to plant trees, like you said that 14 trees can absorb the entire time, <coughs> I mean the garden urgent. Yes. <coughs> so, if we plant let's say around 20, 30 trees per human being, so Let's say in future, what will happen if uh, the plant don't have uh, carbon dioxide to take it and uh, synthesize here? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the good news is that we are never going to run into that problem. <laughs> we are never going to run into it. It will be a good problem to have. <laughs> we will return to ice ages. <clears throat> Sir, uh, second thing, uh, uh, you saw the uh, that, uh, attendance board. You are saying that uh, because of that attendance board, you can uh, figure out that how many workers are there and they are working uh, this, uh, per day time. So, what if some workers come for attendance? Yes, yes. And after attending, <coughs> uh, after getting uh, yeah. their uh, four and then how to solve this? Right, right. Yeah, so, that's why I mentioned that, you know. Uh, it is important for the workers to feel part of the project. They have to be motivated enough to work. So, obviously, we have checks and balances to see whether work is getting done over a period of time or not. Hmm. Uh, but so far, we have not had that problem. Okay. Yeah. No, because uh, you mentioned that uh, the local villager are there, so, so many difficulties are there, <coughs> yeah. serpent chain, so many right, things right. are involved in that. That is why yeah, that's yeah, yeah. what came in my mind. Yeah. So, I think the same problem can happen in a company also that you know you show your attendance and then you disappear, do not do anything. So, at some point you will get fired, right? <laughs> it will take some time for the system to detect that. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yes. I think that is the only sustainable answer. And interestingly, before humans became active, Rainfall was sustaining the whole life on earth. So, there is an existential proof that equilibrium did exist with rainfall. We are just trying to mimic that. And if the rainfall is deficient, you should not be planting trees that need more water than that. You should adjust your template based on what can be sustained with that amount of rainfall. Because if you cannot sustain the rainfall, it is not sustainable. Yes. Sir, at the beginning you told uh, you created 46 ponds in the first time. Yes. So, how do you guys decide where to create those ponds? So, now we have, so uh, interestingly, you know, um, we have not taken any expert advice in this end project anywhere because the entire project scaled up during COVID time and nobody was available. So, it is more like learning by doing things. Now, we have become very good at it that if you show me any land, I can tell you where to dig the pond just by looking at terrain and making some assessment where the water will flow and where to store it. But we had not done any geo-hydro survey to identify the spots, nothing. It is more… Uh, see, I tell you the best software is written not by computer scientists. There are these crazy hackers who have not even passed high school and they are the ones who really do the real software development. So, it is like uh, often time, you know, more experimentation and is what is needed to get to the pulse of something. So, we have just done experiments and we have failed many times and we have learned from it. We have not 
captured that wisdom into some document or a prod, uh, yet. But you get a good feel for it after uh, getting good at it. Yeah. And uh, is the final goal of this project to get that uh, emotional connect to all the people so that they all start planning? No, see, I think you know today all the issues around global warming and you know climate change. People somehow feel that it's a government's job to do something. There is nothing I can do. So idea here is to, unless you make people aware, conscious, it's very difficult to engage them into a constructive exercise. So this is an attempt to kind of, uh, invariably people who are becoming part of this are becoming much more conscious and aware. They become curious to learn more and so on. Because just planting 14 trees will not solve global, problem, global warming problem. It will only get that conversation started. It will just bring that awareness. <clears throat> Sir, I have to ask one thing. Yes. You are uh, working in very small area. Why are not automating that things? Like you are, uh, you can uh, take rainwater and you can put some pipe. And from that, automatically the, it will water the plants. So that labor cost will be saved. So I am looking for somebody who will give me the check <laughs> to fund that. <laughs> At this point, it is cheaper for me to pay labor. But no, no, no. We haven't taken a single rupee from the government yet. And how are you paying salary for the... Like, crowd for, crowd for, sort, crowdsourcing. The same crowdsourcing you can... Come and raise fund for us. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Sir, uh, you have shown a picture of a signboard. You shown a picture for a signboard where there is a sponsorship logo. So, I first met the corporates because there is no scope of advertising there. Yeah. They are like sourcing you for this. So some of those corporates actually are run by my batchmates. <laughs> so I can, you know, twist their arms. So in fact, I'm going to Delhi tomorrow. And a few guys are running big ventures, so I'm hoping they'll write a check. <clears throat> and gradually the word spreads and yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so definitely, you see, that way the IT connection has been very, 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 very instrumental in getting this product off the ground. Because See, who will give you money without any expectation of returns? Only your family members and your friends. So the largest sponsor of this project is IITK 90 batch. And uh, so I think, you know, the relationship we formed in these rooms are helping fuel this project right now. And hopefully that message will spread bit by bit. Yeah. <coughs> Yes. Sir, uh, so this project is both only uh, like limited to Pune area or if in some part of the country someone wants to like uh, go, uh, like uh, uh, contact you and uh, start yes. this whole thing, so uh, like what, what's the process? Yeah, so obviously you want to scale it up. So we are just building a large scale pilot so that people believe that it is doable. And then we are hoping that people from different regions will come and say, you know, I want to do something similar. So we just empower them, you know, do it. So that's how it will scale. It will be a people's movement from all directions, yes. Sir, the contraption you guys made for uh, protecting the sapling. Yes. If you're making that for every single sapling, won't it get very extensive resource-wise? You're making it for food, right? I'm making it with bamboo. And it's a completely biodegradable material. So after three years, it becomes soil. So it's 100% recyclable. And it is generating a lot of employment. After restoring the abandoned land, how will you put it? Like, it will take two years. Then again, the reforestation continues. Then again, it will become abandoned land. It's kind of one to three or two hundred years. So that is the problem you have to worry. I think I'll be gone by that time. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm quite fascinated by this project. I'm a design plus agriculture student. Um, uh, so my question was, like so many times we have the vision but stumble upon executing and how to go forward with forward with it planning it so how was your journey when you saw those pictures uh, of burning right trees right. uh, then 
like how did you plan to go forward with it and how did you scale it up? Yeah, I think you just need a clear conviction and focus to see it's almost like you know uh, there are some people who like to do mountaineering they pick tough peaks to climb and then just go after it and the challenge of that exercise is what excites you so what is exciting in this is actually see football will not be an interesting game if there are no defenders stopping you <laughs> football is interesting because there are defenders stopping you and then you figure out a way out that in some ways i treat this as a football game can you score a goal that you want to despite those obstacles So I think what we'll do is after this Q&A, we will allow those who want to drain out <laughs> and then we will reserve the best for those who want to stay. No, no, we, have, I, we are leaving a free word. I think it will be a few minutes, so we can continue. Third story, I think we can so third story is just a video I'll play. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this movie is about 90 minutes long, but we have created a 10 minute version of it. So I'll just play the 10 minute version and that will be the, so I will not say anything, it's just you watch the story itself. Okay. <clears throat> any, any more questions before we, yes, yes, yes. So obviously wonderful, great uh, uh. examples and involved. but um, what is the, I mean eventually you want to not let it be dependent on crowdsourcing, right? That's the eventual sustainable goal. You would want maybe the government to somehow, or any agency to somehow see it as a viable economic activity. So is that somewhere like... Uh, no, no, so, so, okay. Yes, that's what we would like to happen. But if somebody asks me, do you have that model right now? Answer is no. So till then it is crowdsourcing. Till we figure it out. But we need a completely no strings attached money yes. to do our experiment. If people say, you know, give me the plan, you know, what will happen in four years, five years, I mean, is that... Like this, uh, several employment uh, guarantee schemes that come and government comes with us. Uh, so if this can be integrated with that, and somehow the, uh, the local populace sees a value to doing it. Yes, yes. Then so we are trying, we are trying that. But again, there are hurdles, as she mentioned. Because the current way, the way that scheme is run, there are beneficiaries who won't let it happen because their grease will go away. Especially with our attendance automation, you know. So it's it's a non-trivial problem to track. So I'm already facing resistance. Ki, you know, you do your thing, you know, you do your own thing. <clears throat> but we'll some way we will figure out. But yes, we have to work on that. Yeah. But it is actually quite exciting. I mean, just, I think. If all of you can plan a site visit someday, uh, it's, it's uh, well worth a, a visit to see the whole uh, project uh, unfolding there. So again, you know, if you remember, I started the talk with a, you know, the whole IIT experience sort of liberated your mind to start imagining bigger possibilities. So there, there comes a time when you kind of stop fearing about, you know, where will you find a job, what will, where will your paycheck come from and so on. So you sort of liberate yourself from that worry. It's not that that worry, uh, you know, that you still have to find your paycheck from somewhere, but uh, if you sort of start liberating yourself, you can experimenting with sort of interesting ideas. So in some sense, this is a very utopian idea and we will see how far we can push it. And I think uh, uh, really the relationship with, uh, so we, uh, in collaboration with uh, IIT uh, uh, Kesavan Center, we organized a workshop in Pune for which some faculty members came. And so we are now trying to get this core set of entrepreneurs, tech, uh, um, social scientists, economists to come together to explore this. And that beginning has been made, but so similar to how you know the internet happened in the early days or the open source software movement started, we want to kind of start this uh, tapping of this constructive energy 
Uh, and I think we are off to a good start. Just, just to yeah. add that students yeah. are welcome to participate in uh, the center's projects and activities related to carbon neutrality. Yeah. So if you, if you are interested, you can contact us. Yeah, I think anyone interested, contact Professor Garg and uh, you will be put to some real work. Yeah. <laughs> there are a lot of technical projects uh, yeah. and <coughs> non-technical work, so we will be happy to have you involved. Yeah. So, uh, if there are no question, I will then turn the gear to the third uh, story instead of telling more about so. Uh, so, this is actually a, another crazy uh, idea uh, I was involved in that we celebrated our batch Golden Jubilee by making a movie and movie which captures the life experiences of our batchmates. And the whole process of making this movie was fantastic. I mean, we, we did 19 days of shooting all over the world to capture uh, pearls of wisdom from a lot of our batchmates. Some of them are academic, some of them are uh, running businesses, some of them are doing various different things, some are administrative officers. So we kind of asked them, what have you learned in life in these 25 years? And this movie is just a capture of that wisdom. So I will just play 10 minutes of it. Okay? And it's on, I think, Amazon Prime. If somebody wants to see the film, you have to pay 100 rupees to watch it. By <laughs> it's not free. <clears throat>
what is required to get into IIT scheme without a billion years. I was given warning, but I didn't take any lessons from that. And then I was kicked out of IIT. Yeah. I didn't take any lessons from that. And then I was kicked out of this place. When work is hard, the things are not in your control. There is some force which drives you, and you are driven by that. I have given the JEE exam again. I once again got selected. I joined here again in 1988. So there are two categories of people, right? So one is Amago. The other ones who you can typically see right in the morning, they have a little jhola on their side and they have their bikes and they would just rush to the library or rush to their classes. You could see that flurry of activity. You have to fight your place in the restaurant. Right? You have to fight your place in the breakfast. If you let these people who are going to attend the 8 o'clock class, then you have ample space there to sit and literally eat your breakfast. First two semesters was the proper case, you know, whatever you do, you do. But third semester onward, I said, yeah, this cannot be the right way. Now, when I'm done, what nonsense? is beyond how he speaks. There are other things in me. My sincerity, my integrity, my hard work, my dedication, devotion. So why should I only bother about how I speak? Friends, uh, the kind of uh, conversations I had with IITs, uh, that really uplifted us. Suddenly, I was diagnosed with a very rare disease, which is called the fibromuscular dysfunction. I went in for surgery, my heart stopped beating, and I died on the overdose. Uh, और मेरे पास कोई उपलब्धि भी कुछ नहीं मैंने बोरो की थी उस मैं रात को रोडेज की बस को सुबह तो मैं वहाँ साथ ही तक बारा फिर वहाँ पर मैंने एक डोसा कि तुम होते तो क्या होता खेप मुझको तो बनाया तेरे ना होने दे। The upper portion of my leg had become thinner than this। बहुत अजीब सी एक feeling sinking कर रही थी कि अब मैं क्या कर पाऊँगा? कभी-कभी तो तकदीर हमारे लिए बहुत चीजें लिख देती है, कभी-कभी हम तकदीर को लिखते हैं। Yeah, yeah. Almost every other day I have to be honest. 
Right, uh, because uh, yes, I was thinking like an engineer, Apple. I was thinking of every problem yes, like an engineer. Yes, Apple is Just think about it. Apple is going to go? It doesn't make you a good manager. Looking back now, 15 years later, I know that the problems they require, emotional quotient. And I was thinking things in terms of solving the problems. That's when I started the journey of trying to understand what it takes to work with people. Happens to be a memento. <laughs> so, uh, may I request uh, Professor Gurk to present this to Dr. Kavi? Okay. Thank you so much for coming and <laughs> inspiring all of us. <coughs> so with this, uh, I would like to thank once again for uh, staying back. It was motivating, inspirational, and we do have an interaction session now. Uh, so, so I think you can probably take over. <coughs> well, I mean, uh, it's not a formal interaction session. I mean, if you have any questions, I just wanted to say that, you know, Praveen is doing such a wonderful work in Pune, and we are also going to work with him on behalf of uh, IIT Kanpur, Chandrakanta Keshwan Center, as well as the Department of Sustainable Engineering. We have taken up the task of carbon neutrality of IIT Kanpur, and in, as a consequence of that, we are collaborating in various activities, including <coughs> developing scientific tools to estimate carbon and to, to develop engineering solutions which can work. Maybe some of them can be implemented on its side. So if you, if you have any questions, if you want to be involved in it, 
So if you have any clarifications, you can please ask. And if you if you are hesitant right now and you want to come back to us later, you can always write to me. Okay. So I'll now hand it over to yeah. Yeah, I think we have kept people here for long, so yeah. I think it's time to let people go. And yeah. uh, anybody who wants to have any questions, you can stay back and yeah. ask me. But we don't want to hold everyone. Yes, up here. if you want to yeah. leave yes, them, yeah. please, please. I know it's yeah. <coughs> yes. I'm just curious uh, when you are targeting this carbon neutral campus, uh, is the idea to uh, do interventions on campus or partial interventions can be like the Europeans uh, would say that have been turned carbon credits by doing it to the Pune side, whereas not necessarily in Europe. Do you understand? So one is that are we doing all these interventions on our campus or are we saying that they will do equivalent interventions in, the, in other sites and then claim I think you need combination of both. Yeah, one, one approach will not work. So ultimately, neutrality can only be assumed, can be achieved by bringing about certain, uh, I would say, measures on the site. And whatever you are not able to achieve is what you compensate through some external interventions. So it has to be a. It will be fantastic if you can do it on by on by yourself. That will be. That is the real challenge. That's 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 then ideal. It will be a sustainable model for yes. Anyone. Yes, yes. So that should be Otherwise the. Otherwise, they will be just postponing a problem to another <coughs> place. Yes, like, absolutely. Like but the Europeans are so, so a question to explore is: Is it possible or not? I think we have to dig deeper to even answer that question. We don't know yet. My gut feeling is it will not be possible. But we'll find out. <coughs> because the current lifestyles, yes. uh, unless you bring about change in the lifestyle, it won't happen. Yet. I think thermal, thermal, uh, solar heating, solar heating yes, is something should be. Yes. Some of them have some of them more solar heating. Some of them more solar heating. We have to look into that. Yes. 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 Yes.
uh, general fast there. I still am skeptic about that approach being applicable to large scale forestation that we are doing because the carbon footprint of Miyawaki is very high. You first dig up the land 5 feet, you transport a lot of soil, you put in a lot of water. If you do the calculation of, see in urban setting the cost is not an issue. So my gut feeling is that if you look the carbon footprint of Miyawaki is very high and it won't sustain. And that style of, you're putting, you know, 10,000 saplings in one acre. I don't see that kind of forest in nature through the normal natural equilibrium. So it is a unnatural design. So it's good for urban forestation, but I won't attempt it into the type of setting that we are doing. And actually, if you talk to pure ecologists, they don't like the idea. But people who are approving large budgets, they love it because, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and why do they not like the idea? It is not it's natural. From ecological point. See, you first you have, it's, it requires massive intervention. You dig up ground five feet, you remove that thing, you put in, you transport a lot of soil, fill it up, you bring a lot of water. If you calculate how much uh, fossil you are from spending that. to do it, and it requires immense amount of money. So, because they do, they also talk of native species only in terms of plants, but it's just yeah, like yeah. the other part, the preparation the, itself. The preparation itself is very, very high, uh, for, very high on fossil fuel. And if you look at total budget, it's very high. Yes. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, sir, I wanted to ask a one general question about college life. Sir, how to spend our uh, college life productively? So you will be able to see a bigger picture which I cannot see. So watch the full length movie and you will get all the answers. The movie that I played, there's a full length version available on the net. Watch it, you will get all the answers from 70 people who are going to share their experiences. Exactly. Yeah, another question. Maybe one or two quick questions. Sir, actually you are using Google Fencing, right? Like we are cutting trees for uh, protecting the trees. Why can't we use some classic, which is uh, some kind of idea? Like which is uh, already created? Any ideas in that? So, first of all, uh, see, just like you grow vegetables, the bamboo is like a crop. And bamboo is something that needs to be harvested. If you don't, it decays and dies. So to maintain the bamboo plantation, you have to harvest it. So essentially utilizing the material that you have to harvest anyway. And if you look at the carbon footprint of plastic versus compare it with the carbon footprint of bamboo, you will get the answer. I'm not talking about uh, produce more plastic to protect. Of, uh, existing plastic which is uh, uh, to recycle and can make it something. See, ultimately that plastic is going to go in the ground after decay. So it's better to leave a biodegradable material in the ground than the plastic. Microplastics in soil is a major problem. <coughs> One last question, so maybe. Sir, you have a proposal that you are on sabbatical from Orista from last month, and since you are a foundation of this whole district, so how did you manage your time from beginning, from birthplace to this whole district? Not from last month. I've been on sabbatical for almost three years now. But I've been running this project. Uh, so, how do you manage your time from your workplace to this session? So, actually, that's a topic of my next talk. <laughs> I have a talk on time management. Maybe I'll give you that in my next visit. <laughs> but, you know, you just have to be, uh, I would say, see, time management is a, um, see, you have to be an organized person, very organized person to manage your time well. And I'll give you an example. Often what happens is people uh, go for shopping and then they come home and they remember, you know, they forgot something. So they go back and so if you had that list with you when you were in the shop, you will not have to make that second trip. So it's a very simple example, but thing which you need to do at any point in time 
if all information that you need is already organized for you, you can a lot of time just goes in searching for stuff. And if you can cut down that crap, you can become much more efficient. But it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a longer topic for discussion. <laughs> but yeah, you have to manage your time well to be able to do multiple things. With this, I think we are approaching 8 p.m. So thank you very much for attending. Yeah, thank, thank you, Prabhu, for a wonderful and very really inspiring talk. We'll have them again over here. So yeah, as many times as you want. <laughs>